thank you all for coming out tonight. It's exciting to be back here at Berkeley. Um, it's been a long day getting over here from the East Coast. So uh, if I yawn in the middle of something, it's not you, it's totally me. Um, but I do wanna thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule uh, to come and uh, listen uh, to my presentation and hopefully ask some good questions. We can have some good dialogue. Um, I wanna do a special shout to my husband, Jonathan, who's probably watching uh, right now on the live stream with my kids, uh, who is at home uh, watching our four children and who makes it possible uh, everything that I do at Students for Life, he makes it possible um, because he's the one at home with our children when I'm gone. Um, some of the statements I will make tonight, no shock, are going to be controversial. Uh, some of you will vehemently disagree with the, the claims I make. Um, so I would appreciate if you would hold those questions to the end, um, and then we can have a, hopefully, a productive dialogue with Q&A at the end of the presentation. Um, I also want to start off um, just by reminding you um, what the pro-life movement is about. Um, we advocate uh, and we believe that abortion is the world's greatest human rights tragedy um, that unfolds every single day with 2,600 human beings are taken from this earth and violently dismembered. Um, and while we believe abortion to be a moral wrong and we work to abolish abortion in our nation, uh, we, do not, um, we do not think that women who have abortions are bad people. Many of us in the pro-life movement who are actually post-abortive, in fact, many leaders in the pro-life movement, and some of my best friends have committed abortions, uh, have been physicians who committed abortions or have had abortions. Um, so while we speak about abortion as a moral wrong, uh, we believe we have an obligation to tell the world the truth. Uh, it is not in judgment of those who have participated in an abortion or who have had an abortion themselves. And there is help for you if you are struggling from an abortion decision uh, in your life. Uh, you can go to abortionrecoveryinternational.org. You can go to optionline.org uh, and find a licensed counselor uh, who will help you uh, through your process of healing from an abortion in your past. So a little bit about myself and who I am. Uh, I grew up in a small town in West Virginia with my parents and my younger sister. Um, my father was raised by a mostly single mom with kind of men in and out of, of her life. Uh, he lived in poverty his entire life. Uh, he was the first person um, to graduate high school uh, in his family. Um, he got a good, good, good blue collar uh, paying you know, job outside of school once he graduated. He didn't get a chance to go to college, went right into the workforce. Um, he met my mom in high school, and they got married when she was in college, uh, and they've been married ever since, uh, and actually both uh, retired last year. And um, when I think about, you know, why I am the way I am, right, when we think about how any of us are, we, we often think about our families and how we are raised and how we were brought up. And I always think about, um, you know, you know, why am I the way I am? I think about my dad, um, someone who felt like he didn't have a lot of choices in his life, um, who had to go right to work um, as soon as he was able to work, worked all through high school, had to work immediately uh, after high school, didn't get to go and have the college experience, um, and had a job for 40 plus years uh, that he hated, that he dreaded getting up every day and going to work for. And when I, when I think a lot about how my dad was this primary driver in my life. Um, a good example of, of my dad and kind of growing up with, with Gary Mercer uh, was that, you know, in first grade, I got a B on like a little math quiz, which I mean, grades are like meaningless in first grade, but not to my dad. Uh, and he drove me to school the next morning and made me ask for extra credit. And I had to go there early and do extra credit to make sure I understood what was going on. Um, so it's not a surprise that like I was Valvictorian, I graduated college, summa cum laude, like I had to get straight A's and my dad you know he and we would come into conflict with this right when I was in high school because I had other things I wanted to do I didn't want all this pressure on me and you know we would have these conversations he, he'd be the person driving me to basketball or volleyball practice um, and his point really stuck with me of you need to have choices in your life I want you to have choices in your life 
I didn't get to have those choices. You can do whatever you want to do. And I want to make sure you have choices in your life. That's why you have to work as hard as you possibly can. Um, and you can never let anyone tell you you can't do something. So my dad was his primary driver in my life, right? Um, but I also knew, like, you know, as much as I knew I, like, was going to have a career and where, you know, wherever I was going to be, I also knew, like, I, I didn't just want to work. I wanted to be a mom. That I saw my mom. My mom was this great, you know, hero for me. She worked. She was a public school music teacher for her, her throughout her entire career. And she was, like, the first person up in the morning, the last person to go to bed, making sure all the meals were made, making sure dinner was in the crock pot, um, shuffling us between church and home and basketball games and friends' sleepovers. And, and she hustled all the time. So I knew, like, I just didn't want to just have this choice of a career and education but I also wanted to have this choice of a family uh, and I wanted to have it all right and if you would have asked me in high school um, you know are you a feminist I would have replied enthusiastically like hell yes I'm a feminist right um, because I never felt um, you know I never felt like my gender limited um, you know how far I can go in life I, I never felt that you know I mean, I was better than most of the boys in my class. I had a better GPA than they did. Um, I never felt like I was being held back. And I also knew, like, yeah, I can do whatever they can do. I, I'm not held back because of my genitalia. Um, of course, I'm a feminist. Um, but today at 33, um, I'm often asked now, um, especially in light of the election of President Trump, you know, are you a feminist? What, what is feminist? And people ask me, like, are you feminist? And I'm pretty sure now I don't want that title. I, I, I don't want that title. Even though I'm pretty damn sure my life is a testament to what the first and second wave feminists envisioned for women in our nation. I am a career woman. I run an organization, a multi-million dollar organization. I manage 50 plus employees. I am the primary breadwinner of my home. My husband is actually a stay-at-home dad. He homeschools our four children now. So I'm the primary income earner for our family. I travel all over the country and sometimes all over the world by myself. Um, I'm, a, yet I'm a wife and I'm also a mom. Like, I, I'm living that feminist dream, right? I didn't I feel, ever feel like I had to choose either or. But I think that you know, while, you know, I believe, and I believe the majority of Americans, I mean, there's always like the 1% out there, I believe in the goal of the feminist foremothers, right, of equality, of equality for all human beings, for the right for women to vote, to own property, to speak publicly, to, you know, choose and fulfill their educational and career goals, uh, and also their family goals. Um, why I believe in all that and why I believe my life is a great testament to the rights that women now have in the United States that we didn't have 100 years ago, I'm pretty sure, well, I'm absolutely sure that today's you know, self-appointed leaders of the feminist movement in our country, the mainstream feminist movement, if you would ask them as Kristen Hawkins, uh, a feminist, uh, they would say, hell no. Um, in fact, they would say she's anti-feminist, right? Um, they would tell you that I don't belong within their camp of feminism. I'm not welcome. And the movement I'm a part of and that I help lead is not welcome. And I actually believe the original feminists, the suffragists, the first wave feminists, those egalitarian and the maternal feminists, there's kind of two different camps of the first wave of feminism, um, those badass as women, like you know, Elizabeth Candy Stanton and Alice Paul, Mary Wollstonecraft, Frances Willard, um, they wouldn't be welcome in today's feminist movement either. And it's all over one issue. It's over this issue. Because I believe that taking a needle filled with digoxin, inserting into a heart of a child in the womb, causing a cardiac arrest, giving this child a heart attack, is wrong. I believe that this is a fundamental human rights violation. Then I don't believe that this is ever a choice that someone should be able to make or to pay somebody else to commit this act. This was demonstrated perfectly just um, Shortly after President Trump's election, this President of the United States, right, 
women across the United States decided that they wanted to stand up and protest Donald Trump and his rhetoric. And women of the world and women across the country were going to unite. And I actually said, hey, we'll join into this Women's March. We're an organization primarily of women. We're a movement primarily of women. And this is what we do every day is advocate for the equality of all women, pre-born and born. And so, you know, I asked the Women's March, could we co-sponsor? Of course, my requests uh, were met with silence. A few weeks after the Women's March was officially announced, Planned Parenthood, the nation's largest abortion vendor, was announced as the platinum sponsor. A couple of my friends' organizations, they run organizations that have the word feminist in the title. It's not as overtly pro-life as Students for Life. Uh, they had asked the Women's March if they could be co-sponsors on the websites. The Women's March said, sure, whatever. An Atlantic article was published uh, citing myself and a couple of other of my friends saying, we're pro-life women and we're going to be at the Women's March. Those organizations, my friends' organizations, were promptly removed from the Women's March website. A week before the march, the Women's March released a platform of their statement of beliefs. Suddenly, the Women's March wasn't about all women. It was a Women's March for certain women uh, because they came out and unequivocally stated that they stand for abortion in all nine months of pregnancy for whatever reason and taxpayer funded. But we were there anyway. We went. We had our 20-foot banners saying abortion betrays women. And we, um, because the pro-life movement actually I don't know if you know this, but no other cause in the history of the world turns out more people every year than the American pro-life movement. Every year, a half a million of us gather in Washington, D.C., usually in the snow, rain, sleet, all the same day. Um, I say it's God's punishment for us failing to abolish abortion the previous year, but we were there, and um, we had our banners, and we had a bunch of high school students, a bunch of young girls with me, and we actually led the Women's March for several blocks because they didn't know what they were doing. Once again, we know what we're doing because we do this every year. And we led the Women's March for several blocks past the White House, um, and we, we filmed the entire thing on live stream, and you can watch it. And we actually had to pull off onto the side of Constitution Avenue because the women my mother's age began spitting, yelling, um, pushing our 15, 16-year-old students. And they became violent when they eventually figured out that we weren't with them when it came to abortion. So the rest of the march, we actually stood on the side of Constitution Avenue with our abortion betrays women signs. We didn't have any pro-Trump signs. In fact, our organization, I mean, uh, we're made up of a diverse group of folks, um, political opinions. So when it came to um, the Women's March and being there, women would walk by and they would see our sign. And they would have their like fuck Trump signs or whatever they would have, pro LGBTQ signs. And they'd be cursing at us. And then their friend would look up at the banner and nod, put her head back down and keep walking. We went there. We went there for her. The woman who felt like she had no other options than to pay somebody else to violently dismember another human being. We were there for the women who've died inside Planned Parenthoods, having legal abortions, dying inside of Planned Parenthoods because the Planned Parenthood wouldn't call the ambulance because they didn't want to cause a media circus outside while women die inside. We were there for this generation of women who've been misogynistically told since the the KCV Planned Parenthood decision in 1991 that women need abortion in order to be free. That somehow I'm not equal unless I have a special surgery, which is completely doesn't make sense because if we're talking about feminism and what feminism is supposed to espouse is that women are equal, that by our very design, we are equal to men. But that's not what the modern feminist movement says. That's not what the modern feminist movement preaches. The modern feminist movement says we are only equal to men unless we have unfettered taxpayer access to dangerous hormonal pills that we're told that just put in our bodies and not ask questions for decades. And we don't have, we're not equal to men unless we have access to a special surgery. There's always like this caveat. Men and women, I'm here because I reject the lies of mainstream feminism. I reject the claim that abortion can set us free. That abortion is needed for us to ensure our freedom. That I have to pay somebody, 
that I have to give someone else money to commit an act of violence against another human being in order for me to have equality. Abortion has been and always will be the opposite of empowerment. And I would say it's a distortion of feminism. And has no place in our civil society today. And the question is, what happened to feminism in America? When did the fight for equality become an extremist agenda advocating for violence upon those smaller and weaker than ourselves? Because that's what it is. Throughout the years and the different waves of feminism, there has always been a few core principles that remain constant. The discipline of nonviolence, the demand for equality, the understanding that one human being should never be able to oppress another human being or treat another human being like property. Yet these acts, these principles define abortion. Abortion is violent. You can't argue it's not violent. It's certainly not equality because it argues that some people have more worth than others based on their size or their location. And it certainly oppresses another human being and treats another human being as property because you can say, I can get rid of it because it's an inconvenience to me. And I deem how much worth that other human being has. Now, while some abortion advocates will try to muddy the conversation regarding abortion, saying there's conflicting views about when life begins, the profound reality is that science has proven very simply that what is inside of her is in fact human, right? The law of biogenesis says a human and a human can't reproduce anything besides a human. As much as I freaking want a koala bear, I will never be able to create one with my husband. I will only create more human children. We also know what's living inside of her is alive. It's not dead, right? Because dead things don't grow. Dead things can't act in a coordinated fashion and grow and respond to metab you know, respond to stimuli and metabolize. We know it's a living human being that's inside of her. But regardless of whether you want to agree with science, because some people just don't ever want to agree, we know abortion is the violent destruction of a human being based on the fact that one human being has more value than the other, based on the fact that one person has the right to oppress another. So at its core, abortion should always be considered an anti-feminist act. And our feminist foremothers, the suffragists, they knew this. Mary Wollstonecraft, the revolutionary like British philosopher who kicked off modern feminist thought, wrote openly, wrote openly against abortion. Elizabeth Candy Stanton fought for women's rights alongside Susan B. Anthony. Elizabeth Candy Stanton actually left the slavery abolitionist movement because they wouldn't let women lead. She became discouraged that she wasn't allowed to leave the ab lead the abolitionist movement and joined forces with Susan B. Sarah Norton, the first woman to win acceptance to an Ivy League school, Cornell, wrote openly against abortion. Victoria Woodhull, the first, Ameri first woman to ever run for president, the first female stockbroker, wrote openly against abortion. Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell, the first physician in the United States, spoke openly against abortion. And of course, you also have Susan B. Anthony, right? One of the most famous suffragists spoke openly against abortion. And Alice Paul, the original author of the ERA, it was Alice Paul who said, abortion is the ultimate exploitation of women. She predicted dead on what was gonna happen when second wave feminism adopted, adopted the beliefs that women need abortion to be free. 40 years after the 19th Amendment, 40 years after women were given our right to vote, right, the second wave of feminism kicked off with the 1963 Equal Pay Act, which made it illegal to pay men and women for uh, different wages for the same work. Then you had the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which included prohibited, prohibit, the prohibitations against sex discrimination and hiring and promotion policies. 
Contrary to popular b belief, Betty Friedan did not include the so-called right to abortion or even contraception in the first edition of the feminist mystique. Her book was a rallying cry for women who wanted something more, who felt like something was missing in their life, but it wasn't to kill a child. It was two men, Larry Ladder, the biographer of Margaret Sanger, the eugenicist who was the founder of Planned Parenthood, and <clears throat> Badar Nathanson, who was an abortionist who was committing legal abortions in New York State. They are the founders of NARAL Pro-Choice America, what it's called today. At the time, it was called NARAL, the National Association for the Repeal of Abortion Laws. It was two men that met with Betty Friedan and convinced her that women needed abortion. Ladder actually uh, was the ED of the Hugh Moore Fund. He became an advocate for abortion because he believed in the 1970s pending uh, population bomb. He believed the way to stop mass starvation because the world was going to be overpopulated, which we all know didn't happen, he believed abortion was the ultimate solution. He actually had a falling out with Margaret Sanger because Margaret Sanger, while being a eugenicist, believing some races shouldn't be able to reproduce or certain classes of people shouldn't be able to reduce, um, Margaret Sanger actually never advocated for abortion. They actually had a falling out in their relationship because of latter support for abortion. It was actually according to Bernard Nathanson, who later in life became a, um, after committing, he committed 75,000 abortions in his lifetime. He actually later uh, became a pro-life spokesperson. It was Ladder who actually admitted openly and honestly that there was a myth that 10,000 women were dying a year from illegal abortion. That we know from, 19, from 1959, Planned Parenthood's own medical director, Mary Calarone, said only 200 to 500 women were dying from illegal back alley abortions. Why? Because she admitted that 90% of abortions were being committed by physicians in good standing. And because of the invention of penicillin, because that's why women died from illegal abortions, that's why di women actually die today of legal abortions, because pieces of the baby are left inside of her the limbs, the foot, the arm, and there's infection that happens. With the invention of penicillin, the infection rate greatly de decreased. It was the CDC in 1972, the year before Roe versus Wade, that actually said that more women died from legal abortion that year than illegal abortion. It was two men, two men who hijacked the feminist movement for their own personal gain. Now, Tonight, am I arguing that women go back to being barefoot and pregnant in the kitchen in 1950s America with like no color TV and no cell phones? No. <laughs> I do love being barefoot uh, at my home and I do love being pregnant, it's fantastic. Some of my friends don't aren't so lucky, but I've had some really great pregnancies. That's amazing too because no one ever, everyone always gives you constant compliments when they know you're pregnant. Oh, you look fantastic. Eat some more ice cream. It's great. Today I'm not arguing that. Of course not. But I would say that I don't see a way forward for today's mainstream feminist movement. Why? Because today's mainstream feminist movement demonizes all choices except one. And that's abortion. Today in America, women have full equality with men under the law. The Supreme Court has actually said that in 1972 in Reed versus Reed. Now, are there things that we have to do better with enforcement? Yep, there are. But we have incredible freedoms. Freedoms that women in other nations can scarcely ever hope to obtain. I can own a car. I can own a home. I can inherit wealth. I can vote. I can seek the educational career I want. I can seek the career I want. I can choose if I get married. I can choose my husband. When I get pissed off at my husband, I can walk in front of my husband on the street. I don't need my husband's permission to travel. I can do a lot of things that our sisters in other nations will never be able to do. Yet the abortion industry and those who lead today's mainstream feminist movement claim it's not enough. They say that our interests in integrated and successful life have been reduced to one thing, and that's abortion. And they've institutionalized this radical belief everywhere. It's everywhere. It's in the words of the abortion worker who told my friend Allie, it'll be over in 15 minutes and you can go back to school 
and everything will be back to normal. It's still not back to normal for Allie. It was in the words of the college administrator at the Catholic College, Fordham, who told our friend Eleanor, well, you can go and have an abortion, or you can stay, on, stay in school and keep your child. But if you don't have the abortion, you can't live in our dorms anymore because we don't let pregnant women live in our dorms. And if you choose to move off campus, you're, volunteer, you're voluntarily choosing to reject your housing scholarship. We've been sold a bag of lies from today's mainstream feminist movement. And we've institutionalized this belief everywhere in our country that this is the only option that you have as a pregnant woman. That if you're in crisis, if you're a student, your only choice is to have an abortion. Those lies we've been sold, the first one I would say, is very simple and it's actually very clear. The first, first one is, is that myth that sex is without consequence. Right now, in 2019, we live in midst of what the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, says is an STD epidemic. One in two sexually active under 25 will contract an STD. But we, ha we hear this myth over and over again. In fact, our Students for Life group at Baldwin Walls College last year was actually denied the right to table on their campus during their sex fair because the pro-life message talking about abortion, offering support to women who were pregnant in crisis, wasn't sex positive enough for the LGBTQ-sponsored sex fair. Our hookup culture has made sex into something that's casual. And of course, hormonal birth control and access to abortion had to follow because sex was for fun. Sex has been changed. It's not between a committed relationship. It's not between two individuals who have promised to spend their lives together. It's between those who wanted to create a legacy. It's not for that. Sex is for whatever you want. And of course we had to introduce birth control because a very natural consequence of sex is what? Procreation. And we also know birth control doesn't always stop procreation from happening. In fact, you can look at the failure rates of condoms. It's about 18% a year. The failure rates for birth control pills are 9% a year. Men and women, if the plane I got in this morning had an 18% or 19% failure rate, I would not have gotten in it because I'd like to see my children when I go home. Every decision we make has consequences and sex has interesting ones. Some are embarrassing like a rash. Others are deadly, like HPV or HIV, and others have 18-year-long financial and emotional commitments of raising another human being that you created. But once sex was trivialized, once it was taken out of the marital relationship, we had to be sold that second lie, which was that contraception is necessary for the advancement of women. That my fertility is not a gift, but it's something that has to be suppressed. It's something that has to be controlled. Look, men and women are different. Biology and social science confirms this fact. There are differences with men and women, and that's okay. You don't actually have to look very much further than our brains. Women's brains, I would argue, this is why we are the superior sex, are more networked. We have more neurons connecting the left and right hemisphere. This is why I can multitask. This is why yesterday I was on a conference call making three dinners and making sure four human beings didn't harm each other or themselves. This is why when I go away, and hopefully my husband's not listening at this point, if I do not grill the hamburgers I've made my husband, I've just made the patties and put them in the refrigerator, he won't eat them because he'll say he didn't have time to make them because he was too busy focusing on the kids. He has a task and he is going to get that task done, but it's very hard to get deviated off into another task. Our brains are just wired differently, and that's okay. Stephen Rhodes, a professor and researcher at UVA, talks openly about this. I'm like, one of the easiest ways to show that men and women differ are if you just look at depression drugs. There's some drugs that treat men with depression, but they won't treat women because our brains are different. But Rhodes actually, he talks about 
what happens in a gender-aligned society and why ignoring the differences between sex and trying to pretend like there's no difference is actually damaging. He said, because if you try to have a gender-aligned society, the goal will always tend to transform itself into making women more like men. As a result, male interests, male values, male priorities set the agenda for women aspiring to break into the ranks of the powerful. Is that not what we have today? Is that not what we struggle with as women in the workforce today, right? We have to change our laws. Right now, we're advocating right now as Students for Life and working very hard for a national paid family leave policy. But it's extremely difficult because we've had to adapt to the male workplace. We've had to adapt. We know that hormonal contraception not only can it be an abortifacient, but we also know it doesn't prevent abortions. The chief executive officer of BPAS, the British Pregnancy Advisory Service, the largest abortion vendor in the UK, recently admitted in the Huffington Post, and by their own study, that over half of women who procure abortions do so because of the failure of their contraceptive method. 51%. In the Huffington Post, in response to this study, the chief executive said, our data shows women cannot control their fertility through contraception alone, even when they're using some of the most effective methods. Family planning is contraception and abortion. Abortion is birth control that women need when the regular method lets them down. We also have seen the scientific articles about how contraception is bad for our bodies. The Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center up in Seattle has done numerous studies actually listing out every single type of birth control pill that's on the market today and the increased rate of breast cancer from taking those pills long term. This actually used to be something that was somewhat controversial when I would speak on campuses, but now we eat organic meat. I only buy organic milk for my children. Of course, I only buy hormone-free products for my family, so of course, putting Artificial hormones in your body for 20, 30 years? Probably not a great idea. Last fall, a Danish study published in the American Journal of Psychiatry tracked 500,000 women for eight years. It was the largest study of its kind. Once again, this is not a pro-life source. Found the risk of attempting suicides was nearly twice as high for women who took hormonal birth control. There was actually a fascinating article and a lot of secular newspapers this summer on this fact of why the Wall Street Journal was reading this article and it was a study that was done on depression rates and suicide rates. It used to be male suicide was significantly higher than female suicide and the same with depression and now women have almost caught up to men and they actually in the study in the Wall Street Journal that was summarizing the study they said it's, 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 phar it's pharma. They were blaming big pharma and then they had a list of all the drugs, and you click on the list, and oh, and surprise, hormonal birth control was on that list. But that didn't make headlines. We have the World Health Organization, it's classified birth control as a group one carcinogen, the same as cigarettes and asbestos. Despite all this, how many women in America actually know these facts, or actually have had a discussion with their OBGYN about the risk factors? In fact, if I bring this stuff up on national TV, it usually results in just like nasty tweets and comments and I have to turn off my Twitter for the weekend. And the argument usually goes like this. You're so fat and ugly, no one would ever have sex with you. That's why you're anti-hormonal birth control. I have four children. I've been married for 13 years. I have sex a lot. I have no problem admitting it. And I have great sex. So, I mean, I, but, but that's the level of argument. Hopefully my husband was watching that. I spoke at um, Boston College a week and a half ago, and someone shouted out, have you ever had an orgasm? Because apparently that's why I'm pro-life, because I haven't had an orgasm. And my husband actually texted, and he was like, you can tell him the truth, honey. <laughs> so I got it in there for him. We haven't been told this. Why? Because we've been duped into believing the lies of mainstream feminism and taking it for gospel truth. And then the information counter to these facts can't be that discussion can't be had. It can't be had because it means you're a bigot or a religious intolerant person or just a crazy person. I reject the notion that I have to ingest carcinogenic drugs to alter my body's normal function in order to be equal to men. Newsflash, I already am equal to men. Like I said, I think you can make a really good case that women are actually superior sex. 
We are the superheroes. We can gestate, menstruate, and lactate, something men can never do. Like, we do things men can't do. So when the contraception fails, whether you're using a barrier method like a condom or diaphragm or a hormonal type of contraception, which, as I said earlier, will happen, then, then we're sold the third and fourth lies in mainstream feminism, which is that abortion is needed for women to achieve their goals, and it's harmless and it's safe. We can start with the fact that today the abortion debate isn't about whether or not abortion kills. In 1995, third-wave feminist Naomi Wolf wrote New Republic, the statement that abortion stops a beating heart is inconvertibly true. No, the argument today is whether or not women's freedom and well-being demand legal access to abortion. In fact, in the Supreme Court case, the Hellerstadt case just two years ago, 113 Female lawyers wrote an amicus brief to the Supreme Court, telling the Supreme Court that they would never have become lawyers seeking the career of their dreams had it not been for their abortions. How freaking sad was that? That they had to admit to the U.S. Supreme Court that they paid somebody to dismember another human being, and if they had they not done it, they couldn't have achieved their goals. Shame on us that she felt like she had no other choice than to kill another human being, that we didn't offer her another choice. Rather than seeking to serve pregnant women in, her, in their moment of crisis, we simply tell her to Google abortion or to go to the Planned Parenthood, which will be you know, conveniently located right down the street from the college or high school campus. As she seeks advice from her friends and her family, She'll hear the feminist mantra of your body, your choice, over and over again. The subtext of that, what she hears, is just have an abortion. When someone, when a woman in crisis hears your body, your choice, she hears have an abortion. Because if you didn't want an abortion, you say, you don't have to do it. it. Sounds nicer. Instead of helping her in her moment of crisis, we fail her. I would argue that our country has actually gotten lazy because we've had a legal abortion for 43 plus years. We actually haven't had to have that difficult conversation of do we have enough resources? Do we have enough support for her? Because I've been in front of the Planned Parenthoods on a Saturday morning praying. No woman ever excitedly goes into a Planned Parenthood saying, I'm just exercising my reproductive rights today. Freedom to choose, yay! No. She's dressed in baggy sweatpants. She's often crying. She's looking down. She's trying not to make eye contact with those praying outside of the clinic. She's there not because she feels like she has all these choices. She's there because she feels like she has no other choice. First wave feminist Maddie Brinkerhoff wrote, when a man steals to satisfy hunger, we may safely conclude that there is something wrong in society. So when a woman destroys the life of her unborn child, is it by evidence that either by education or circumstances, she has been greatly wrong? We have failed her through our own laziness. If you're a Christian, I would actually argue that the Christian church has failed her. The Christian church has failed her. In fact, just a year ago, a young woman came to us who was 4.0 student, student body president of her Christian high school, became pregnant, and was told she was no longer welcome back in school. Her family fought for her, got her back in school, but then her school said, well, you have to go in front of the entire school and admit your sins, and then accept a two-day suspension. And Maddie did it. I don't know how she did it, but she did it. She went in front of her entire school, after she did that, accepted her two-day suspension, which was similar to other students who had violated the code of conduct of school, like drinking or smoking or being caught having sex. Then she was told, you can't graduate. You're not allowed to walk across the graduation <coughs> stage seven months pregnant. It was the pro-life movement that stood up. She contacted us. I contacted the school. I reminded him that he was a Christian. That conversation didn't end well. Usually when someone says, look here, Missy, it... It's going to go bad. Um, and we, I offered him. I said, I'm giving you an out. If you do not do this, we will go public with this story. So, of course, I went to the, the one news organization I knew would love to rip Christians. I went to the New York Times. 
and we told them my story. It was a front page thing on a set Sunday morning. And we, we did a public relations campaign of telling people across the country to call the school, demand that Maddie could walk. They never relented. They never relented. But it was the pro-life movement that stood with Maddie. We held an alternative gra high school graduation for her. We threw her a graduation party. And it was the pro-life movement that raised $16,000 for a college scholarship for her first year of college. It was the pro-life movement who did that. If Planned Parenthood had their way, they would have just told her to have the abortion. And the additional consequences of the abortion decision, beyond destroying her nature, by, beyond destroying her offspring, her child, the health risks to her are scarcely mentioned at all. Researchers in Finland have identified a strong statistical association between abortion and suicide in their records-based study. They found the mean annual suicide rate for all women was 11.3 per 100,000, but the rate for women following abortion was 34.7 per 100,000, three times higher. The suicide rate associated with birth, by contrast, was half the rate of all all women, and less than one-sixth the rate of suicide among women who had abortions. Over 20 studies have linked abortion to increased rates of drug and alcohol abuse. Lowest incident rate of PTSD following abortion is 1.5%. Another study found that 14% of American women have all the symptoms of PTSD and attribute them to their abortion. Analysis of 15 years of published research in the British Journal of Psychiatry found that women who had undergone abortion experienced an 81% risk 81% increased risk of mental health problems. 2003 landmark article in Gobstetrical and Gynecological Survey compiled the results of several studies on abortion. They showed that induced abortion increases the risk of placenta previa and later pregnancy by 50% and doubles the risk of preterm birth. Placenta previa is, um, if you don't know, it's very dangerous. It's, yeah, you can bleed out. My sister almost died when she was uh, giving birth to uh, my nephew with that. This is commonplace because if you're pregnant, you go to an OBG1 office. One of the first questions they ask you is how many births have you had, how many miscarriages you have, how many abortions you have, because the medical community knows this, these are your risks. A landmark study published in Cancer Causes Control in 2014 concluded that one abortion increased the risk of breast cancer by 44%. For women who had two abortions, the risk rose to 76% and then almost doubled after three or more abortions. Abortion isn't safe. It's just not this s simple procedure. And then while we're at it, we don't need predatory businesses like Planned Parenthood either. In fact, there's more than 8,000 federally qualified health centers across the country that serve women, men, and children. And they do a lot more services than Planned Parenthood actually will ever provide. There's less than 600 Planned Parenthoods across the country. Federally qualified health centers serve 21 million American Americans every year. Planned Parenthood serves less than 2 million. Federally qualified health centers are 501c3 organizations. They're not one of the nation's largest lobbyist machines uh, like Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood boasted they put more than $30 million in the 2016 election, more than $20 million in the 2018 election. Between 2006 and 2015, Planned Parenthood's services dramatically dropped. And in the past 10 years, their contraceptive services have dropped by 22%. Their breast exams have dropped by 65%. Their, paps, their pap smears have dropped by 72%. Their adoption referrals by 42%. Their total services have dropped by 11%. But you get one, know what went up? Taxpayer dollars and abortion. Despite the fact that abortion's declining na across the nation, Planned Parenthood's abortion services went up by 9%. We don't need abortion vendors who profit off of women in despair. The fifth lie of mainstream feminism that you'll often hear, and you're going to actually start hearing a lot more now, is that we need to pass the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment. You may be like, what the heck is that? Or, I heard that in history. That's dead. That's right. It died in 1982. The ERA was supposed to be this amendment to the Constitution assuring women's full equality, which we don't need because in 19... 71, this U.S. Supreme Court held in Reed versus Reed that the 14th Amendment applied to not only men but also to women. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the feminist icon, has actually said that the ERA would invalidate over 800 laws that have actually already been passed to protect women in the workforce, in their careers, from discrimination. The ERA is about one thing and one thing only. It's a 
the, everything related to Abortion Act. In fact, last week, Nay Rao sent out a fundraising email admitting this. They said, in order to protect our reproductive freedom today, it's essential we pass a newly reintroduced bill to ratify the ERA. With its ratification, ERA would reinforce the constitutional right to abortion by clarifying that sexes have equal rights, and which require judges to strike down anti-abortion laws. Two states that passed state ERAs, uh, New Mexico and Connecticut, their state Supreme Courts found that because they had passed the state ERA, the state actually, taxpayers in the state, had to pay for abortions in the state. Because once again, the feminist movement made the argument that women weren't equal to men unless they had access to a special surgery. So today we're going to hear this. We're going to hear it more and more from the feminist movement, as they're afraid that Roe versus Wade's going to fall, which by the way, it is, and if I have anything to do about it, Roe versus Wade is history. The abortion decision will go back to the states. States will get to vote, which by the way, 63% of millennials agree that they should have a right to vote in abortion policy in their state. 51% of millennials, after being told that Roe versus Wade in its companion case, Doe versus Bolton, legalize abortion in all nine months of pregnancy for whatever reason, 51% actually agree that Roe versus Wade is wrong. But we're going to hear this over and over again, that we need ERA, that we need the Equal Rights Amendment passed. It's about one thing and one thing only, and that is abortion. That's what ERA is about. So don't be fooled when you hear these talking points coming out. So where do we go? Those of us who reject the violence of abortion, those of us who know we can't just ship her off to the predatory abortionist down the street who's waiting to profit from her despair, what do we do? What do we do in the pro-life movement? We're the ones actually advocating and fighting for real choice. We're advocating for nonviolent health care. We don't think... Unlike what Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act actually said, which by the way, this should piss every woman in America off, ACA actually said that pregnancy was a preventable disease. We don't believe that our ability to gestate another human being within us is a disease. We don't believe that our fertility is something that has to be suppressed or something that has to be controlled. We don't believe that. We understand that sending her off alone to the abortionist, saying it's your body, it's your choice, is wrong. There's no justice for her. The reasons that led her to the abortion facility will still be there the next morning. The abusive relationship she's in, the poverty she's experiencing. We've just prolonged and potentially compounded her struggle. Instead of seeking to build a real relationship with her, provide real social justice, we just outsource our duty to Planned Parenthood. It's the pro-life movement, the pro-life generation, that actually advocates for support for women and families in need. Because we don't believe in just shipping her off and outsourcing the problem. Because we want to help her build a life for her and her family, to create a legacy. At Students for Life, we have a program called Pregnant on Campus, and it was inspired by those feminists who call themselves pro-life. It's the pro-life movement on the campuses that's meeting with their administrations, that's asking why aren't there lactation rooms, that's helping pregnant and parenting students. Just a few months ago, we had to write a letter to a Title IX coordinator at a state university in Colorado reminding them that women have Title IX rights, that because she was giving birth and she missed the final exam, that didn't mean she didn't qualify for financial aid. It was the pro-life movement who did that. So honestly, do I call myself a feminist anymore? Do I care? No. I know I don't want my voice. I don't want my story. I don't want it co-opted by this feminist movement. I don't want the, I don't want that. I know I want the lies that they sell, the fear mongering that they use, to be brought to light. I want women to know that the choice isn't either or. I don't want any woman to ever feel ever again like she has to choose between the life of her child and her education or her career. I want women in our generation to know that nonviolence and equality, those two fundamental principles found throughout the waves of feminism, are actually found in our movement, our pro-life anti-abortion movement. That's the label I care about. 
So we've got 30 minutes for questions before I have to head to the airport. Isabella, a great champion for what feminists should be inspiring to, um, is going to be holding the mic. And you have 30 seconds to ask your question. Um, and then I will try to answer it as quickly as possible. So go to Isabella, line up. Oh, it's really. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Lily. Um, so the progressives have taken over the education system and are teaching the students far left ideologies. How do we reason with those feminists when they are being brainwashed to see everyone else who doesn't agree with them as fascists yeah. and brainwashed to shut us down by any means? Sure, yeah, I mean, Obviously, I mean, we're fighting a law right now in Colorado that's basically going to allow Planned Parenthood. I mean, this is how crazy it is. Planned Parenthood is a vested interest in women making bad decisions, right? Because the goal is to get in and build a relationship with young women as fast as possible. The sooner she starts having sex, she's going to come into their door. She's going to get on their birth control. Then she's going to have to come for STD tests. Then she's going to come for STD treatment. And then she'll have to come to them for abortion. So, like, they have a vested interest in this, right? Planned Parenthood is actually going to be able to go in and write the sex ed curriculum for the state of Colorado. That's what we have. So, I mean, obviously, yes. I mean, we need to stop it. And we need to empower parents at the local level to say, look, like, you should have some say in what your child's actually being taught. And those who profit from abortion, from children having sex early and earlier, maybe they shouldn't be the ones writing the sex ed curriculum. Because maybe they have another motive. The abortion industry literally makes a billion dollars a year. Planned Parenthood is a nonprofit that profited over $200 million last year. They're one of the largest political machines in Washington, D.C. Their president boasted about how she turned Planned Parenthood the nation's largest political machine. So I think what we do is we empower parents. We continue to educate people what, what's going on within the schools. I think parents, you need to talk to your kids about abortion. You need to talk to your kids about sex. Don't let these people do it for you. I think that's what's wrong. And yes, they're, I was compared to a white supremacist this weekend in a news article because I advocated for free speech on college campuses. And you're going to get it, and it's fine. They know they're losing and they're becoming desperate. But they're also smart because they realize the way you create social change, cultural change in society, is you change young people. All right, thanks for coming. I think uh, an argument that um, these women are probably gonna make is if you outlaw abor uh, abortion nationwide, sure. you'll increase the rate of uh, illegal abortion like by coat hangers, and they cite um, logic by like right-wingers. If, if you outlaw guns, that's not gonna do anything to stop uh, gun violence from happening. So I was just wondering what your take sure. is on that and how you address that, that uh, misconception. Yeah, no, this is, this is a very common question, right? Even when we get this from people who are against abortion, who say, I don't like abortion, but I obviously don't want women dying from illegal abortions. And there's a few things you have to do to unpack this. One I mentioned during my speech, Mary Calderon, the National Medical Director of Planned Parenthood, in 1959 publicly stated, and you can Google this, you don't have to trust me because you know I'm pro-life, uh, you can Google this, publicly stated that 90% of illegal abortions were being committed in the United States by physicians in good standing. She actually also publicly talked about what was the death rate from illegal abortions happening in the United States at that time. And she said it was between 200 and 500. But Arne Nathanson, the founder of NARAL Pro-Choice America, who admitted to making up the lie that 10,000 women die a year from illegal abortions, actually stated that it was about 500 a year that were dying from illegal abortions. We also know the CDC, the Center for Disease Control's own records in 1972. I think it was like 35 women that year died from legal abortions and 24 die from illegal abortions. Don't quote me on those numbers, but it's about, it's like a 10 woman difference and it's in 30 and 20. And you can Google that too. Don't, you don't have to believe me. So I think the first thing you have to understand when you hear this argument is the information you've been fed have been lies. And you can go to Planned Parenthood themselves to see what's happened. Because the reality is, is when January 1973 came around, the Supreme Court said we're wiping out all state abortion laws, we're mandating a national abortion policy, which 
you know, if you're a conservative or a federalist, you have problems with that. It, there wasn't like a universal, oh my gosh, we're training abortionists now, right? There wasn't like this universal abortionist training program. People who were committing abortions just simply were able to advertise it. And no one ever made the argument that these were back alley abortions. There was like, oh, there's abortionists and they're certified. It was the same damn people. I think the second thing you have to think about is when you're talking about making abortion illegal. No, making abortion illegal won't stop all abortions. No. It will greatly reduce them. The 13th Amendment banned slavery in our country. Did it end slavery? Slavery still exists in our country. Has it been greatly reduced? Hell yeah. So I think it, it doesn't, it's not going to, it won't make, that's why in the pro-life movement we say we want to make abortion illegal and we also want to make it unthinkable. We also know if you look at, sadly, a large percentage of our population derive their morality from legality. So if you look at polls, of, you know, did people support abortion before Roe versus Wade, the majority opposed it. Once Roe versus Wade was handed down by seven men, um, the polls suddenly switched. Suddenly people were in favor of legal abortion. People derive their morality from what's legal, which if you look at the history of our country, that's a very scary thing to do. Um, and we should, we should be very careful about deriving our morality from legality. Um, so yeah, I think you know, the obvious response here is 13th Amendment didn't completely abolish slavery, but it greatly reduced it. Um, and we continue to fight it today. And that's exactly what we'll do. Hi, I just have a quick question. Um, <clears throat> what do you say to progressives who use who talk about rape and incest, and they try to use that case uh, mm -hmm. for, for pro-abortion. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, that's the number one question we get on campuses all the time is, what about sexual assault, right? What do we do? Do we, what does the pro-life movement advocate? Um, I think the first thing is really important when we're talking about sexual assault is I think we need to talk about the horrificness of sexual assault, right? Um, that's one of the worst things I think that could happen to another human being is someone else to force themselves upon you. Um, and I have a lot of friends who have gone through this experience and have s survived sexual assault and are still healing from it. Um, and if she becomes pregnant from a sexual assault, um, this is gonna be the most difficult dis choice decision she's ever gonna make. Um, in the pro-life movement, we'd say, she has three choices at that point. Um, and we, we realize it's about 5% of sexual assault cases do result in a, a non-planned pregnancy. So she has three choices. She can either first carry the child to term, which we know is going to be um, emotionally uh, difficult, financially difficult for her. She's being forced to become a mother, and no one wanted her to become a mother. Um, the second thing she can choose to do is courageously place her child with an adoptive family. Uh, which I ha one of our team members, Amanda, who works for us as a birth mom, I can think of no greater selfless act than choosing to place your child with an adoptive family. But that's emotionally very painful and um, very difficult. The third thing she can do is she can hire a doctor to kill the baby, to shred the baby or give the baby a heart attack. Um, and we believe in the pro-life movement that the rapist should be punished for all of that um, because he's committed multiple moral crimes, right? Um, however, I believe, and many in the pro-life movement believe, that abortion in cases of rape is wrong. Because we have to believe that. Because we, want, we are philosophically consistent. We believe that a, a pre-born child is a unique, whole, living human child that has value and has rights. And it doesn't matter the circumstances of your conception. It doesn't matter who your parents are. You actually have innate value and you have dignity because you are human. Because you are just like me. We share our common humanity. So um, one thing I would say when we talk about rape, um, I always like to ask students, you know, let's visualize here a woman who is a survivor of sexual assault finds out she's pregnant, courageously chooses to keep her child, to birth her child and parent her child. Um, she's in therapy, she's getting help she deserves, she's on the road to healing, and let's just say at two years, uh, suddenly her baby boy starts reminding her of her rapist. His eyes are like her rapist's eyes. 
He looks like her rapist. And this is starting to cause painful flashbacks, right? This is starting to hurt her. And it's getting to the point where she's starting to, like, hate her son. And she's starting to think about she's having, like, murderous thoughts towards her child. Should she be allowed to kill her son? I've never met anyone who said yes to that answer, right? And the obvious response is, no, she shouldn't be allowed to kill her two-year-old son. Why not? Because he's a human being, right? He has value. That's the point the pro-life movement makes, that the child in the womb is exactly the same as the two-year-old toddler. And there's no philosophical difference between the embryo, the zygote, the fetus you once were, and the person you are today. You were always the same person with the same value and the same worth. You just looked a little different or you live somewhere differently. Next question. Uh, yes, I'm uh, concerned and saddened by the polarization around this topic, and it's getting worse uh, over time. And so I'm trying to see how we can create more dialogue, a constructive dialogue. And I'm wondering about your experience with uh, dialogue and what sort of a path you see forward, uh, perhaps having that constructive dialogue? And would you have a dialogue, for example, with the protesters? Uh, yeah. Obviously, this isn't the place to have dialogue because they came to protest me. But that's actually what we do on college campuses. So right now, we have our Planned Parenthood Truth Tour going to 135 campuses. And we're actually highlighting all of the instances of Planned Parenthood's atrocious like buildings um, and, and ways they've hurt women, the rusty medical equipment, how they haven't been regulated. Because it's abortion, it's kind of like the icky subject. We don't regulate abortion facilities. I hope you, don't, you guys understand that. Like, we regulate hair care facilities and nail salons more than we regulate abortion facilities because no one wants to touch it. Um, and so it's interesting that you say that. Like, our whole goal on campuses is to have dialogue. The, that display was on campus today. The whole goal is to get people to come over and we ask them, do you trust Planned Parenthood? Can we talk to you about Planned Parenthood? And then we let students vote. Okay, after you've gone through our materials and you've considered what we had to say, just tell us how you feel. And it's actually pretty amazing because you have a dialogue with somebody and if they actually listen to you, we convert like 50% of people who actually listen to what we have to say. But it's hard, right? Because most times they're like, fuck you, and they walk away, right? They don't want to listen to what you have to say. They spit at you. That's what happens. But if you actually listen, I mean, that's what's so interesting about the pro-life movement. I've had to consider their arguments. Because I just had to stand up here and tell you that a woman who experienced the most horrific thing a woman can ever experience, if she becomes pregnant because of sexual assault, has to choose life. That she has to, she can't kill her baby. That's a difficult position for a pro-life person to take. That's a difficult position for anyone to take. And so as pro-lifers, we've had to consider the other side. So yes, I'm, I'm same with you. I wish everyone could sit down and have a conversation about abortion. I loved debates. I love dialogue. Why? Because we always win in the end because we have philosophy and science on our side. But we love to have debates. But they'll get schedule me for a debate. And like two weeks later, guess what always happens? It gets canceled. The other side backs out. I was supposed to speak at a public high school last week and I got disinvited. And I said, well, if you don't want me to speak, why don't we have the teacher that's protesting me and let's have him speak for 10 minutes, I'll speak for 10 minutes, and then we'll let the students decide. But no one wanted to have that. They did, oh, just having discussion about abortion would disrupt the educational environment of the school. And I think that's a problem when we're too afraid to have difficult conversations. So I would share your concern. Next question. Hello, I'd like to thank you for coming out. And um, as a man, I didn't really have much of an opinion on abortion. I thought that was more of a like philosophical and spiritual battle amongst women. But I've noticed, especially with, um, there's men and women feminists, and there's men and women third wave feminists. And I've noticed the men, because I can read men. I can't really read women, but I can read men pretty well. <laughs> That's a common male problem. You're not alone. Different worlds, you know. And um, from what I've seen with uh, a lot of third wave uh, male feminists, I think they're, a lot of them are sexual predators that just like want to cheapen sex, you know, and the woman kind of feels empowered by that, but they're really just being used as a piece of sex, you know, and, um, and I think we're, um, our society's 
being programmed towards that, you know, to keep us more distanced from each other and just keep us all spiritually bankrupt. And I think abortion is a side, uh, just a, a side byproduct of um, sex not being sacred anymore. And so I'm not sure where my question is, but I'm just like, (laughs) but I'm getting to that as a man on the other side, like, where's my place in this? Well, the first thing I say is arguments don't have genders. It doesn't matter what freaking gender you are. You can have a belief on abortion. In fact, actually, you could be the biggest hypocrite on the face of the earth and like have multiple abortions and then argue against abortion, right? Like, it's, it's an argument. It's a philosophical argument. So arguments don't have genders. Like, men have just as much right to say that they oppose abortion um, as women do. It's always funny, too, because I always get, like, yelled at the Supreme Court when we're protesting by men who are holding pro-choice signs. So the feminist movement is all about men coming out on their side, but then, like, the two men on my staff who come out, they get, like, screamed and shouted at. It's, like, this really interesting thing that happens. So you're totally... Men are totally valid in having an opinion against abortion because guess what? So this Saturday, I was with one of my good friends, Jason. He's post-abortive. Oh, heck, today at lunch, the supporter I met with, I had no idea, shared at lunch today that his first wife got pregnant with their third child and had an abortion. He begged her not to, and she did anyway. Men actually have been totally emasculated with abortion. They're told, oh, you, we need you for child support, but shut the hell up. You're not allowed to say whether or not we keep a child. We have men who call us all the time saying, my girlfriend's pregnant. I don't want an abortion. How can I stop her? And I'm like, you can't. You've get, been given no legal recourse in the United States of America. So it's totally unfair to men, and you definitely have, um, you definitely have a say. And I would agree. Like, the first wave feminists were actually opposed to contraception. Why? They opposed contraception because they believed it would lead to promiscuity with men, men sleeping outside of the marital contract and allowing them to do what they want with women. It's kind of what we have today. The men can do whatever the hell they want and then give us $500 to have the abortion. And it's totally reflective in today's porn, porn culture. Next question. Hi, thanks for coming out and speaking tonight. Um, you speak very passionately on the subject of abortion. Yeah, <laughs> I noticed. Um, I'm wondering if you have any experience, you know, personal or otherwise, uh, that you draw upon that contributes to how strongly you feel about this? Yeah, I am not post-abortive. Um, I actually got my start in the pro-life movement when I was 15. I kind of fell into it. Um, a woman I knew was a part-time accountant at the pregnancy center, and she was like, yeah, I'm working at this pregnancy center. You need, a, you need an internship to graduate high school with honors. You want to come work for me? And I was like, Sure. She saw free labor, um, and I was like, great, I get my volunteer hours. I had no idea what I was walking into was a pro-life pregnancy resource center. And I just remember that first day, like, walking out of the pregnancy center, like, completely ashamed. Like, what the hell was I thinking? Because when I walked in there, I, I knew abortion was bad. My mom had told me abortion was bad. I grew up in West Virginia. Um, but if you would have asked me, like, are you pro or pro-choice? I'm like, oh, pro-choice, because it might be wrong for me, but I can't tell somebody else they can't have an abortion. Or I'm like, what if I did become pregnant? Like, how would I graduate high school, right? There was always that, like, I need it now, right? I need that out. Um, and I remember, like, when I sat down and the women at the center were like, I was very lucky because they were very excited to have me because I was the same age and sometimes older than the women you're coming in. So they were like, we're going to train you to counsel them and to be the first person they meet and to sit with them while the pregnancy test um, is happening during those you know, crucial three minutes. And so I had to learn everything there was to know about abortion. Um, and I just was like, what the hell was I thinking? And why is no one's talking about this? And so that's actually how I got, that's how I got in the pro-life movement. Um, I'll never forget the, what well, part of learning everything there was about the pro-life movement was I was given like a stack of books and a bunch of VHS tapes. That's how old I am. And um, the first video I popped in uh, was a video of babies who had been b- aborted via saline abortion and then thrown away in the dumpsters outside the abortion facility. 
and these little babies were this size or little, little and it's different because they still do the needle, but the needle goes through her abdomen into the amniotic fluid and it's salt, saline. And so what happens is it burns the baby on the outside and as the baby breathes in the amniotic fluid, it burns the baby on the inside. So the babies come out basically charged, like charcoal burned. Um, and this, this man was holding these babies and I was like, why isn't anyone talking about this, right? Why isn't, I was a Christian, I'm still a Christian. Um, why isn't my church talking about this? Um, and so, yeah, I just, I wanted to be an aeronautical engineer and then I walked in there and then I came out this way. <laughs> Next question. Hi, um, for me, it saddens to see, um, saddens me to see the gap between how much these days we are having struggling with uh, trying to have babies mm -hmm. and the value of life is just increasing at the same time the other way like it's not recognized as value um high value so doesn't make sense does it doesn't make sense it's very hard to have go through the adoption process as well so there's huge gap between so what are the steps that pro-life movement is taking to to connect those a little bit closer. Also, second question would be, uh, me as a, a, a one of the leaders in Christian communities, I'm trying to see what are the practical steps for me to be able to communicate the value of life without coming across judging those who are struggling in their um, different crisis or different you know, questions they have. Um, what are some tips that you can give to us? Well, when you talk about adoption, Adoption agencies are run by pro-lifers, <laughs> just a little shock, um, because this is what we advocate in the pro-life movement is adoption, right? Adoption is a good option. You're a good mother if you choose adoption. Sadly, in our society, the way we portray adoption, even the way Hollywood portrays adoption, is if you're bad, is if you're giving up your child. Even the way we talk about adoption in our society is messed up. We say, she gave up her child. No woman ever gives up her child. She places her child with another family who she believes can take care of her child better than she can. But she's not giving up on her child. She birthed that child. That child lived within her for nine months. She's never going to just forget about that. Um, but we don't, we don't treat adoption with the value we should treat. And it's totally messed up when you think of how many people in your life who are suffering from miscarriage, who are suffering from infertility, who want desperately nothing more than to have a child to love in their home. And then, and then, 2,600 times a day, those children are being snuffed out of existence. I can tell you how many times people contact me, like, can you, next time you're in front of an abortion facility, please, we'll pay whatever, all of her medical bills, all the legal fees, just tell her we'll take her baby. Like, we'll do whatever we want. And it's such a dichotomy with our society, right? And it's totally messed up. It's totally messed up. And even the way we talk about it, it's like, can't you see? Can't you see what's going on here? Uh, Michelle Obama in her memoirs talked about the, how she grieved and she was suffering from depression from having these miscarriages. And on the same hand, her husband actually advocated that babies born alive after an abortion shouldn't be resuscitated, that the doctors shouldn't have to resuscitate a child. Like that literally happened. We have like audio of him saying that that it's not human. So, I mean, it, it, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't, and I think that what's, what it's so hard is that there's like this paradox where people just shut down. Like, they don't wanna have to consider abortion. Because when you consider abortion, you study abortion, you'll walk away knowing abortion's wrong. But it's gonna radically, it could radically transform your worldview about everything. And you have to be ready for it. That's why so many people don't want to think about abortion. That's why when we have crosses in the ground representing preborn babies who die every day from abortion, people get pissed. They put their cars on them, they take them off, they throw them, like they're screaming. That's like the most, it's not graphic, there's no bloody images. That's like the, that is the one thing we do that everything, it always gets vandalized, right? Because I'm forcing someone to think about this. And they don't want to think about it because thinking about it's hard. And it may mean that you might have to change the way you're living your life or some decisions you're making in order to be consistent. So um, I think when you're talking about, you know, how can you in your, you know, as a Christian, you know, talk to women, I think 
get involved with your local pregnancy resource center. There's more than 3,000 pregnancy resource centers across the country, and these centers will do whatever they can to help her and her child during pregnancy and after. Um, they're there. I think our biggest problem in the pro-life movement is we kind of suck at marketing. Planned Parenthood gets a billion dollars a year and they put in, they have a nice blonde white doctor and it's like, here, we're Planned Parenthood, we care. And the pro-life movement people are like, no one even knows that there's a pregnancy resource center down the street that will provide everything. They'll find the OBGYN, they'll make sure everything's paid for. Um, but we just don't market ourselves. So I think get involved, get information. Like where's your local pregnancy resource center? Where are the federally qualified health centers? There's actually one like not too far from here. I passed it on the way in, it's the free clinic, right? Um, where are these federally qualified health centers that women can go to for help, for real help? Help that's not biased, somebody's not making a profit off of her despair. Um, and I think the way you talk about abortion, I mean, we teach at Students for Life like apologetics, like how to talk about abortion in a loving, compassionate way. I mean, obviously this presentation is, a, is used to like elicit response because the title is Lies, Feminists Tell and Everyone Gets Pissed, right? Um, but there's a way to have a loving um, dialogue with, with people on campus. So I mean, there's different ways, there's different ministries. Um, you can pray in front of an abortion facility. You can counsel in the front of an abortion facility. You can get involved in the pregnancy center. You can work at the maternity home or the transition home. Um, uh, you can serve women who are post-abortive and are going through a healing retreat. It just kind of depends on where God's, where you feel God is calling you to serve. Like, I know where I'm supposed to be in a product movement. Like, I don't like to go in front of the abortion facilities. I get, like, nauseous. I get sick to my stomach. Like, I couldn't do it because you're literally seeing two people walk in and one pe one person walk out. Like, I, I emotionally I can't do it, but I can do this all day long. Let's bother me. Oh, oh hi. Um, so I, I guess uh, when I um, try to follow the pro life movement, I see a lot of like different organizations, um, and they're they're all kind of like pro life, but they're kind of like running independently. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm wondering, like, what what efforts there are for the organizations to work sure. together. Well, there's actually fewer pro-life organizations than you think. A lot, and actually, from when I started in the pro-life movement 12 and a half years ago, full time, there's actually less less organizations. It's actually you can you can tell the maturing of the industry, right? There's actually a handful of us. Uh, there are multi-million dollar entities and there's a lot of startups, which I think it shows you in any like markets, the maturing of the market of the industry. Um, but we do actually work together. Actually, I just sent a proposal on my way here to, to the largest pro-life organization in the country. I think we're the second or third largest saying, hey, let's partner on this special project and can you send me $200,000 to do it? So um, we do partner. I mean, there are like, there's meetings and secret things that go on, you know. Um, these guys like to say that they're like Rico and like racketeering or whatever when we get together because we're so scary. Um, but we do partner. We actually do partner, I think, a lot more than people think. I actually, some people sometimes argue like, why aren't you just one big pro-life ink and then, you know, we could send all of our money to one place. I actually don't like the idea because my number one thing, in case you haven't noticed throughout my talk, uh, the thing I thrive on most is competition. I will be the best um, and I will be everybody around me. I think competition makes us stronger. And I think it forces us to be um, more entrepreneurial and I always strive to be the best. And so I actually like that we're separated. I also like that we're separated out because it's like real life whack-a-mole. Like they're still trying to sue David Daleiden, right? And David can't do certain things now because of the lawsuit. Guess what? The rest of us just do his work for him, you know? So they, you know, you might, you know, tie David up in courts, but the rest of us are still here. Like, put one of us down and another one rises up. And actually, in our case, like, two or three more rise up because we're training the next generation of leaders, so. Okay, is this the last question? Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, uh, first off, I'll plug Alpha Pregnancy Center in San Francisco. And then um, I just wanted to say, like, I heard that after the Holocaust, um, the Allies had the people go and look at what happened in the um, gas chambers and stuff. Yeah. And I heard that um, when people see sonograms, like 3D sonograms, then they're way less likely to have abortions. And so there's kind of a parallel. And uh, I was just thinking about Unplanned, the movie that the Motion Picture Association of America made it rated R, even though you don't have ironic, to. Huh? Yeah, that's ironic. But then. Um, Twitter banned them and then started unfollowing people and then reset their follower account 
and uh, Rotten Tomatoes critics, there was like, what, 15 people give it like a 50, which would be like an F. But there was like thousands of people who are normal people who gave it like in the 90s, which would be like an A. So it seems like, so basically, what are they trying to hide? No, it's, it's fascinating, right? Unplanned, a movie with Abby Johnson, who is a, a Planned Parenthood abortion facility director who converted and became pro-life, um, which actually has revealed a lot about what's going on in Planned Parenthood, like the fact that they have abortion quotas, right? You can't be an abortion, like, they're not just there to, like, help women, like, oh, just do an abortion, whatever. They actually have to sell abortions. They're literally an industry. Um, but, um, yeah, so the, they gave a, a rating R, and it is, I think it is graphic, because it shows the reality of an RU486 abortion. It doesn't show a dead baby. It shows her bleeding out in her bathroom, which I think every college student in California and America should watch, because right now we were in Sacramento yesterday testifying against SB 320. Um, that's the bill that's going to force. It started from alumni here at Berkeley. It was, you know, the goal was we need to dispense RU486, the abortion pill on college campuses throughout the state of California, turning every state university into an abortion promoter. RU486 is like the most painful freaking abortion you can have because you take one pill at the abortion facility, one at home, and you have a very, very painful miscarriage. And that's why women die. A woman actually died not too far from here in San Francisco because she bled out because they tell you you're just going to bleed, you're going to bleed. But she doesn't know when she's bleeding too much versus when she's hemorrhaging. Um, but they like it because then they don't have to pay for the disposal of the bodies. No one has to chop up a, a baby, so they don't have to convince a person who went to medical school for eight years to become an abortionist it's the, the burden is more on her for the abortion um so yeah i mean the are the the i mean it's a graphic movie so i mean i'm okay with it being rated r but it's funny right you, you have to be what 17 to watch a rated r movie but like you can be 12 and have an abortion in california and no one would give a damn and you'd be told that's your reproductive rights as a 12-year-old and your parents don't even need to be told. So it's just, it's showing, it's just showing, I mean, once again, they're afraid. Like, why, if you're, if you know you're right and you know your argument is philosophically and scientifically sound, then why be afraid? We actually have an unplanned challenge right now at Students for Life. We will pay for any pro-choice person who wants to go see the movie. We'll buy your damn ticket. And we've encouraged pro-lifers, like, if you want to go and take a pro-choice friend, we'll pay for both of your tickets. Because that's the power of the movie. So, I mean, it's like, why are you afraid? What are you afraid of? That's why, why, why can't we have a debate about abortion? Why can't we have a do dialogue about abortion? Why are we told when we bring it up on campus, oh, we don't want to talk about that because that disrupts the learning environment? Because any time we talk about abortion, we win. And they know we're winning. That's why they're acting crazy. That's why you saw what happened to Judge Kavanaugh in Washington, D.C., because that was about abortion. The women who are clawing at the Supreme Court doors the day that Brent Kavanaugh was confirmed, they were clawing at the Supreme Court doors because they're afraid Roe v. Wade and Doe v. Bolton are going to be overturned. The entire media spectacle that happened in Washington, D.C. was about abortion. And they're already gearing up for the next Supreme Court hearing. So, like... That's what they're afraid of. Thank you guys for coming, I appreciate it.